You know, I've been thinking about um, just how the Lord blesses us. Like, it's His intent to bless His children, to, to bless the people of God. And today, I'd, I'd like to actually talk um, about the charge that God gave Aaron and Moses to bless the people. And you find that in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. And it says this, The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the one who wants to bless your children. You want to put your name on our lives. You want us to be marked by your holy name. So, Father, I thank you that is, that is your desire, is to bless us with your presence, to bless us with your love and your sovereignty, your righteousness, your holiness. So, Father, I pray that we would um, open our eyes to see how you want to bless us, Lord God, even in the times that are trials, the times in our life that are trying. You are there. So, Father, I pray that we would receive your blessing today and all that comes with it. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. You know, a blessing is asking for God's divine favor to rest upon us. Could you guys use a little bit of favor from the Lord, right? I could. And that's His desire. His desire is to bless His people, a people that walk with Him, that know Him, and that are blessed because of Him. So this blessing, it identifies Yahweh, that's the name of God, as the author, that is the author of everything that is good. He is the blesser. God alone is able to bring prosperity in your life and peace in your life, especially to those who are faithful in any time and any age in human history. And the purpose of blessing someone is to communicate God's desire to bless and to cover them at all times. So that is the purpose of blessing someone, like Aaron was charged to bless someone. Blessing is also seen as intercession. Intercession that God would live among His people, to live among us. It's a prayer of intercession, asking God, invoking God to bless His people, to meet their needs, to be with them, that they would have a sense of His presence day in and day out. And every, every Sunday when we end, I end with this prayer, the Lord's blessing. And I remember years and years ago, maybe like, I don't know, 19 years ago, I, I was um, discipled by an older pastor. He's retired now in Philadelphia. And he would end the service the same way. He would end with the Lord's blessing out of number six. And I started to look into this and wonder why was he doing this when I didn't really see others doing this. And we talked about this. And he said, Jake, when, when the people of God leave the sanctuary, they have to know that the presence of God goes with them. That they are going out into the world, but they're not going out into the world alone. They're going out into the world with the presence of God, the blessing of God. They are a blessed people, a holy people. And so what is the context of this blessing? And it really matters because when you look at Numbers chapter 1, all the way, or uh, I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 1, all the way through Numbers chapter 6 where we see this blessing, a lot of us look at these, these uh, books and these chapters as being challenging to read. And really, this is a time in Israel's life where he is developing them as a nation. They just escaped um, Egypt, and they were 
people that were, you know, that, that were pulled together by Moses, that believed in God, they were the Hebrews, and then they come into this Sinai desert, and he establishes them in a desert place. A lot of times we don't like desert places, right? And you say, well, why do they wander for 40 years in the desert? Well, they were disobedient. God was also doing a lot of things in them. See, when they went into the desert, they, they didn't have a government. They didn't have an army. They didn't have a, a system of worship. It's like in the desert is the place where God commanded Moses. And actually, the next chapter of Numbers chapter 7 is when he builds the tabernacle. Like, how do we approach God in worship? And it's in this desert place where he, the, the people of Israel are led by a cloud of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. He's with them. And even when they camp out and he establishes the tribes and, and, the, and he puts the tabernacle in the center, he places the tabernacle directly in the center of all of the different tribes that surround the tabernacle, the very presence of God. And you think, well, in 40 years they were able to go into a territory and take it over because they had an army. In the desert place, that was where God established a government. Moses and the 70 elders established there. And sometimes it's in the desert places of our life that we can see the greatest blessings of God. Now, of course, for Israel, these were hard lessons. They didn't want to see the blessings of God, right? They were hungry. He gives them manna, blessing of God. And what happens? Complaints, right? I'm getting sick of the blessing of God. And so you see somewhat of a rebellious heart towards the blessings of God for, the, for uh, the chosen people here. But nonetheless, in the midst of the desert, God tells Aaron and Moses, and He says, this is how you're to bless the people. Remind them constantly that I'm a God who wants to be with them. And so when you look at the first from Leviticus to Numbers chapter 6, it's all legal material. How should the people of God live their life? And on the very end of that, in, in Numbers chapter 6, verses 20 through 2 through 27, you see what? You see this blessing. It's like if the people of God and keep the word of God, God's blessing is going to follow. That's why I see, I, I, this is how I see the placement of Numbers chapter 6, 6, verses 22 through 27. It's at the end of this legal material, but then you see the very next chapter, you see it's all about the tabernacle, the worship of God, right? It's the people of God who love Him and His law and His way. They're going to be blessed by God, and they're going to also, in turn, because of the blessing, they're going to worship God. Why? Because He's good. And in many ways, this is the Christian life. He has a way about himself, and he has a desire for us to live our lives in a way that um, falls in line with his righteousness and his holiness, but he wants to bless us with his presence in the midst of all of that. So we see in verse 22 of this blessing that Yahweh is the author of the blessing. So when God blesses you, He's always the author. Even after service, after service, after gathering, after gathering, it's not Aaron that is actually blessing the people. It's actually God is the blesser. That's why it says in verse 22, the Lord said to Moses, He's the one directing, hey, I want to bless my people. Aaron and Moses are just a conduit. So Moses was the mediator Aaron was the mediator between God and the people, but it was God who was the one who wanted to bless them. When you look at verse 23, he says, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them. It's almost like a prescription, right? It's kind of like when you bless them, bless them in this vein, right? It's kind of like the Lord's prayer that Jesus gives, and so Aaron was to be the first one to discharge this responsibility. It says Aaron and his sons, that's the, the priestly family. They were to give a blessing and constantly remind the people every time they gathered with this blessing that God's desire and heart for you is to bless you, not to harm you. 
to prosper you, not to beat you down in the desert. He wants to give you a land that is flowing with milk and honey and not this desert, this arid desert landscape. And so the blessing is the method of pronouncing God's favor among His people. And they did this at the close of every worship uh, service, every time they got together. You know, it was interesting because when you start to look at blessing and you say, well, what does that matter for us? Is this something that we should do? And if you turn to Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 51, this is really interesting when you talk about blessing, right? So we know that Jesus, that He lived, He was crucified, and He rose again. Well, in the moments when He, he, rose, uh, when he, when he rose again and He walked for uh, a, a time period among, as, as a resurrected Christ, he, he, he showed up and appeared to many of the believers. Now, the very last thing that He did before he actually was taken up, was he blessed his disciples. This is what Luke chapter 24, verses 50 through 51 says. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. Oftentimes we forget about this. Now, of course, Jesus... In the same vein as the priesthood, he is the, the high priest. He is the ultimate blesser. But even you see here, Jesus is the one that is blessing his disciples. And then you even see in the early church, the apostles, they practiced this act of blessing the people of God. It continued in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verse 14 says, May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is a, a type of benediction that you see, and you can see it all throughout. Romans chapter 1, verse 7, Galatians 1, 3, uh, Philippians 1, 2, 1 Timothy 1, 2, and there's just, it's all throughout. This concept of just individuals that are, that are leading to be a, a blessing, to bless the people of God and to remind them that He is the one who wants to be with them and to bless them, to prosper them. And so you have to remember that it's not these ministers that have any power or authority. It's God that is acting. They're just stewards. They're called to be a blessing, to pronounce a blessing over the people. And so blessing God's people is an act of intercession, and it speaks of God's blessing over them as they go out into the world. And that's what we do every Sunday. It's a speaking a blessing over you as you go out into the world. So when you look at the blessing, you see that the ultimate blesser is Yahweh. You see it in verses 24 verse 25 and 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. You see, God wants to bless you. God wants to bless you. And so the divine name Yahweh is repeated here to make it clear that God is the source of all that's good. He is the source. He blesses with His presence. He blesses with prosperity. He, pre he, he blesses with protection, with peace, with love. He, he blesses us. That's His heart towards us. So Yahweh was named, and it, the Hebrew people, they would even take like the like the, the vowels out of this, and it would be Y-H-W-H. Why? Because the one, Yahweh, is one that is looked with reverence. He is holy, but He is also the one that's all-powerful, all-knowing. He's all-present in this being who says, I am who I am, is the one who blesses you. And nothing can stand away of Him. Now, we know that God is the blesser, but let's look at the elements in the blessing here, and I think this is important. When you look at the elements 
of the blessing. So verse 24, it says, the Lord bless you and keep you. What does that even mean? The Lord bless you and keep you. What is, what is the desire of the keeping? Sorry. The name of the Lord, once again, it's, it's the first uh, word that's invoked, the Lord. And really, to keep you. It's interesting because, one, you see that it's the people of Israel gathered, but it's very specific, the you. It turns from the plural, the people of Israel, to the individual. I think that's one of the first things I looked at. I was like, wow, the blessing is actually for the individual, but it's done in the context of the, of the whole unit, of the corporate worship. God blesses us individually. God blesses us individually. Verse 23, it says, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them. That's the third person. But in verse 24, the Lord bless you and keep you. That's the second person singular. So the blessing is for every faithful person. God's blessing comes to us singularly. No one is lost in the multitude. So when we gather corporately, you're not lost. You see, specifically, God wants to bless you. In some regard, this is a corporate faith, but in in the most powerful sense of God's blessing, it's specifically for you. That means He understands the areas that you need His blessing, the areas that you need His divine help and guidance and strength, the areas of need or concern. So God wants to bless you and keep you, meaning He wants to enrich you but will also guard and preserve your life. He wants to keep you. Keep you means to keep or to watch or to be on guard. It means that he is affording the person that he wants to bless, to to give oversight and protection in every circumstance of your life. He wants to keep you. He wants to keep you. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God is the one who blesses you by keeping you. Psalm 121, verse 7, it says, The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. He wants to keep you. He has the power to guard and to preserve your life. No matter what stands in the way, He is the one who keeps you. Verse 25 um, says, the Lord make His face shine upon you. What does that mean? For the face of the Lord to shine upon you. It really means a blessing of acceptance and favor. It's the opposite of hiding His face. It's the opposite of removing His presence or His favor. He wants His face to shine upon you. You hear that thunder? It's kind of creepy. Just saying. And when it says, the Lord make His face shine upon you, His face is His presence. He wants His presence to just radiate over your life. And I could use that, right? I want to keep in step with the Spirit. I want His face to shine upon me minute to minute and day to day. It's a request for His Shekinah glory to brighten your life up, to save or to sanctify you. If you read Psalm 44, verse 3, you can see this imagery of the face of God. It says this, It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. 
It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. You see, God shines His face on you because He loves you. As a heavenly Father, He wants to bless you with His presence. He wants His glory to shine on you and be with you. Psalm 80 verse 7 says, Restore us, God Almighty, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Also in verse 25, it says, and be gracious to you in the blessing, and to be gracious to you. What does that mean? It's a petition inviting the grace of God over our life. We all could use a ton of grace. I need it all the time, more than I even know. It's a petition inviting the Lord to provide His grace and His compassion for His people like the psalmist said, is people that even walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Grace describes the one um, in a superior position. He's doing a kind act to the one who's inferior. That's us. And we have no claim to Him. But because He shines His face on us and He wants to bless us, He is gracious. Not because we're deserving, but because His intentions are good. Why? Because He is good. His intentions towards you is love. Why? Because He is love. It's a request for God to extend His undeserved ki kindness on us. Undeserved kindness. Now, I don't know about you guys. When I experience trial, I feel like I deserve a little bit more than that. And a lot of times I'm a little bit of vocal. What in the world? I'm a little vocal about that. So is God. God gets a little vocal too. When I get cantankerous and I feel like, you know, this, I was wrong this way or this happened or this circumstance. And you tend to blame the circumstances quite a bit. And we could all use a ton of grace. But the reality is, is that no matter how we feel, how much we think we deserve, the grace that God gives us is never something that we deserve. We're not as good or deserving as we'd like to think. That's the fact. And your flesh convinces you and twists you and contorts you in all different ways to think that you deserve something. Well, because we generally think that we're God's gift to the earth. The problem is, is we all think that. And not all of us can be right. And I think that's what makes him so good, is that he is gracious. That his graciousness and his favor is undeserving kindness. And that's the prayer that Aaron was to pray, and may God be gracious to you, meaning may God give you His favor even though it's not deserving. Even though you don't deserve it, may God be gracious to you. Verse 26, the Lord turned His face toward you. What does that mean? It's an invitation. The Lord is invited to turn or to lift up His face. It's a request that God looks directly on you as an individual. May God turn His face towards you. Not away from you, but towards you. And when His face turns toward you, it's with everything that He is. His presence, His goodness, His love, His mercy, His kindness, His strength, His wisdom. It's all there when He turns His face towards you. And it's a prayer, it's an intercession that you would receive His full attention. His full attention. Or that He would give His full approval or grace towards you. So His face is turned in an upward or cheerful attitude towards you. He's gracious. His face is turning towards you in approval. 
not earned, but because of His grace. When God turns His face toward you, there's also an assurance that He's mindful of you, that He cares for you, and that He's with you. And so this is the prayer, this is the blessing. May God turn His face towards you. And it says, and give you peace. Shalom. Man, we live in a day and age where there is no rest for the wicked. And we're all wicked at some point, I guess. Because we ain't resting. This is crazy time that we live in. But God's peace is available for those that love Him. For those who He turns His face towards. His peace, His prosperity, His completeness, His health, His safety, His general, everything that He wants to do in you, there's a peace that can happen even in the midst of the greatest storm. And so when we talk about this word peace, shalom, it's not merely the absence of conflict. Many times it's in the midst of the conflict. It's in the midst of a storm. You think about Peter, right? Peter, look at Jesus, not at the storm. I wonder when Peter looked at Jesus, what did he experience? Right? So he's looking at Jesus, but then he looks at the storm, and, and, and he, he screams out as he begins to sink, Save me! It's like, it's, like a, it's like a cry, a fearful cry. It's kind of the opposite of peace. Now, it doesn't say this, but, it, but, but you, 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 know, you may infer that maybe when he's looking at Jesus, there's a sense of peace. This is the one who has done unbelievable miracles that I have witnessed, I've seen. He's the one that can calm a storm. When you begin to understand the fullness of who he is, you know what? Peace is, seems to be a little bit more easier to accept because you know Him. Shalom is not the absence of the conflict. And we always run from the conflict. Shalom happens in the midst of the storm. It means the fullness of life, wholeness, that there's adequateness or completeness in all areas of life, there's, there's this sense of peace, and that's material, relational, emotional, spiritual. It affects all of you. And peace is a hard thing nowadays to find. You, know, you think about Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9, where it talks about don't be anxious of nothing, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, by with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. It's a searching for his peace in the midst of trial, anxiety, the circumstance, the situation. And that's what God wants to do is bless you with a spirit-filled peace in every moment, in every situation. So what's the result, church? Verse 27, it says it. So they, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. They will put my name on the Israelites. He's speaking about Aaron and his sons and the ones that are doing the blessing. But his desire is not necessarily about Aaron's performance. It has nothing to do with that, actually. They're just a tool. The thing is, is that God wants the name, his name, to be on his people. And he wants to bless you. So the purpose is clear. It communicates His desire to cover you, to put His name on you, to be marked, to be sealed as a person that knows the Lord, that He is your Father, that He is the one that is blessing you and covering you. And He desires to transform you so that you bear His name in His image. And His name represents His qualities, His nature, His attributes, his personality. He wants you to bear His name. And when you bear His name, that's, 
for all who see your life. He wants people to see you and see the name of God written all across you. I will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. This blessing becomes a petition that God might live among His people and meet all their needs. And as He's doing that, the people of the world will see that these are people that have the name of God over their life. And it's He alone who can bless you. He is He alone that can keep you. He's the only one that can give you this divine favor by making His face shine on you and to turn His face toward you. To truly give you this grace, this power, this powerful grace towards you, undeserving, and in the midst of it all, to give you peace. Peace.